A long time ago, with the holidays so near, little P. Allen Smith began decorating with cheer. Not plastic, not lifeless. I want something new, something natural and fresh, like nature would do. And so began the tradition of fresh greenery at the farm, cut, decorated, and styled, filled with so much charm. When the temperatures begin to drop, I just have to say there's a treat that I can't resist. It's hot chocolate. What I love about this recipe is it sort of elevates that flavor profile just a little bit because we're using a surprising ingredient in the way of cayenne pepper. This one's called hot golden cayenne. I picked these this morning. We're gonna start by taking a quarter cup of water and just pour that into a medium saucepan. And then what I have here, I have six tablespoons of cocoa and then I have two tablespoons of stevia sweetener. And what I wanna do is I'm just gonna cook this on a low heat until that becomes the smooth paste. Now it's time to go to step two of the recipe, and that's to take five and a half cups of skim milk and just add this to the mixture. Ooh, I wish you could smell this chocolate. I'm gonna add one tablespoon of vanilla constantly stirring. And then I have a quarter teaspoon of the cayenne pepper. A little bit of this goes a long way. Now this is finely ground. And then I'm taking two small sticks of cinnamon and dropping it in here. And the last ingredient is just a little pinch of salt. Got about an eighth of a teaspoon of salt, just a little bit there. That'll enhance the flavor. And really that's all there is to it. What you wanna do is just continue stirring this until it comes to a a light boil, then just lift out the cinnamon sticks. You're ready to serve it. It puts to use some of that cayenne pepper you may have grown in your garden and actually brought in and dried. It's also a little healthier approach to hot chocolate using the skim milk and the stevia sweetener. This will serve six people. Give it a try. I think you're gonna love this recipe. So here's the deal. The holidays are a time for decorating, right? So why not do something that's a little more interesting rather than just applying decorations to those traditional venues, like using fresh greenery in some areas that express a little creativity, like my chicken house here. You see, greenery is just not for the front door anymore. You can use it to adorn posts, gates, staircases, and really any place you want to add a little holiday spirit. So get those new ideas flowing and find some fun and creative ways to apply greenery to your holiday season this year. Right, Elmo? Don't you love that wreath? You like it? You know, if you're gonna have a party after dusk, the way to really make it shine is to add some illumination in some fun and clever ways. Lighting makes all the difference. Now, when I have very little time and I've gotta come up with something creative, I'll often turn to this simple idea, which is just a few ingredients and anyone can do it. <laughs> in fact, it's sort of a just add water technique. I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. This is for the holidays, but you could do this in the summer using the foliage of different types of plants. Since it's the holidays, we're actually gonna use some holly berries that I picked just on the hedges. I'm gonna take these pieces, which are about four to five inches long, and I'm going to place them in jars like this and you can see that I've got a little votive floating in the top. These are staggered heights, which lends, I think, a little more visual interest. But 
As I mentioned, this is a just add water idea. Just start with some quart jars. You can use uh, fruit jars like I'm using here if you want sort of a rustic country look. Uh, and just drop in some of the foliage and berries in this case and just fill these up like this. And let me just add just a little more here. There we go. And you just wanna make sure that the foliage of the plant is just below the rim of the glass jar. All right, now, it's just a matter of adding some water. Here we go. So I'm just gonna fill this up. Now I do recommend that you thoroughly wash the foliage that you're gonna pop in there because what will happen is uh, that dust or soil could go into solution and it'll settle in the bottom of your jar. And just look how pretty this is. It's very clear and bright and fresh looking. And the last step is simply to take one of these little tea lights um, and light it and then just set it afloat in the water. And suddenly you have a very creative light source for your tablescape. Give it a try. It's as simple as adding water. When fall begins to kick into gear, it's time to start thinking about harvesting your winter squash. Now, this is a squash that grows throughout the summer, but it's called a winter squash because it's a great squash for storing. You see it has a hard outer skin that actually allows them to last throughout the fall and well into the winter months. Some of the varieties include butternut, acorn, as well as turban squash. So you may be asking yourself, how do you know when a winter squash is right? Well, it's back to the skin. It has to be really tough. You can take your nail and push into it like that. If it doesn't leave an indentation, well, it's probably ripe and ready to go ahead and bring inside. Now, one tip on harvesting winter squash, you don't wanna break the stem off the vine because you can tear the vine, which damages further growth. Um, also, if you pull the stem out, it opens up the squash to be more vulnerable, so it's likely to rot much faster. So I suggest taking just a pair of pruners and clipping the stems at about this length when you harvest. Now one way to get your winter squash to last longer is to cure it. Now this uh, tip refers to all winter squash except for acorn. What you wanna do is you wanna collect them and you want to keep them in a warm place that has good air circulation for about 10 to 14 days. And this cures them or hardens them off and then it's time to store them for the winter. Now I have to say one of my favorite winter squashes is this one. It's the spaghetti squash. It's a great way to get the most out of your garden by producing some of your own noodles.
Don't you just love vegetables that are exuberant? You know, I'm talking about those that just produce and produce and produce in the garden, like tomatoes or zucchini, or in this case, eggplant. From mid to late summer, I get so much eggplant. It's just amazing, and I love coming up with ways to use it. I have to say, one of my favorite recipes is one called eggplant tamponade. It's wonderful to serve at parties, and my friends always want the recipe. We're gonna start with, like I said, one medium-sized eggplant. And you see, I've chopped this up into small pieces. I'm gonna take this eggplant, and I'm gonna put it in this medium-sized uh, pot, and then I'm gonna follow up with some onion. This is one large white onion chopped into similar size pieces. Then I've got half a cup of coarsely chopped mushrooms. I'm go in here, and then one third cup of some bell pepper that goes in here, and then three cloves of garlic. There they go. And then one third cup of vegetable oil. Now, I wanna cook this after I've stirred it all together um, over a medium heat. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the lid and put it on there, I just want that to to simmer again for about 10 minutes. Okay, let's take a look in here and see how we're doing. Looking pretty good. I'm gonna get them to the stage where they're just getting nice and soft, and that's where we are here. What I have here is a half a cup of olives with the pimentos in them. I'm just gonna pour those in there. And then a quarter cup of ripe olives. There we go. And a quarter cup of capers, little small capers, and they've been drained, no juice. We'll give that a little bit of a stir. And then we're gonna add some tomato paste. Look at this, isn't that gorgeous? And this is a 16 ounce can of tomato paste. I'm just gonna fold that in. Wow. Now, as you can see, this paste is really thick. What we wanna do is we wanna add about a quarter cup of water. And I'm gonna follow that water with a quarter cup of red wine vinegar. All right, and there we go. You can look in here, you can see I'm folding all this together. It's really, really beautiful. Okay, now it's time to add an herb from the garden, one that's a bit like eggplant in that it just produces and produces, and that's oregano. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take one tablespoon of oregano, fresh and chopped, and add that like this and then some dried oregano. And what you want is one teaspoon of dried oregano. And then it's just a matter of salt and pepper. Um, I like it slightly salty, so I'm gonna add two teaspoons of salt and one teaspoon of cracked black pepper. There we go. Now what you wanna do is you just wanna continue cooking this. Um, you just want it to simmer. Um, for about 20 minutes to 25 minutes. You want um, those vegetables to have cooked down, and this is oh so delicious. I hope you'll give it a try. Man, is my mouth watering just smelling it. Mm. One of the most enjoyable things for me about winter is forcing bulbs to bloom indoors. But I'm often asked, what do you do with the plant after the flowers fade? Well, if you live in a mild part of the country, you can plant things like amaryllis and paper whites directly in the garden, and they'll bloom again next year. These bulbs can't take freezing temperatures, but there is a way to get them to rebloom indoors. It's difficult to do with paper white, so what I do is just grow them off, and once the flowers begin to fade, and as you can see, these are on their way out, I just enjoy the foliage for a while, and then I discard them. But it's a different story with these amaryllis. If you've priced amaryllis bulbs, you know they don't just give them away. The larger the bloom, generally the more expensive. And these premium bulbs will usually put out two or three flower stalks and lots of blossoms. But it's always my goal to try to get this flower to come back next year. And it's all about reinvigorating the flower bulb. You see, for a plant to produce this many blooms, it takes all of the energy out of the bulb. So what I'm gonna try to do is help it recharge itself. Once the beauty is gone from the flower, I cut the stalk just above the bulb and encourage the foliage to continue to grow. From here on out, it's all a matter of treating it like a house plant. Keeping the foliage healthy is critical because this is what feeds the bulb. And if it begins to flop, you may need to stake and tie it. 
Now feed it a couple of times a month until late fall. Then back off of the water and the food. Keep it in a place that's about 48 degrees for eight to 10 weeks. Then bring it back into the warmth of your home and in no time it'll bloom again. You know, here where I live in central Arkansas, we can get our first frost in that sort of first week, second week of November range. Now, if you're not sure when your first frost is, you can go to the USDA map, that's United States Department of Agriculture map, and you can know about when you're gonna get that frost. Well, you may wanna know why that's important to know, and it has nothing to do with putting out these silly chicken sculptures in the garden. It's about harvesting those last vegetables out of the summer vegetable garden like tomatoes. Who doesn't love tomatoes? Come on over here, I'm gonna start gathering them. You can't believe how many tomatoes these plants produced over the summer, and there's still a few green ones left. If a tomato has a slight sort of pink or even reddish cast to it, it's going to ripen on its own after it's been cut from the vine. But if it's green, you may want to check it because not all green tomatoes will continue to ripen. And the best way to do this is just simply cut the tomato in half and look in it and examine the gel sac. If that area is not intact, if it's hollow, it's likely that that tomato will never ripen. So just use this little test and you can figure out which ones you can keep and ripen in the house and enjoy for just a little bit longer that wonderful taste of summer. Just because the temperatures begin to drop and the seasons change doesn't keep me from entertaining outdoors. Now you may go, well, you're not gonna entertain during the winter outside, are you? Well, yes, I think that on those mild days when it's not too cold, it's the perfect opportunity to have friends over and enjoy nature at its best in the winter. But if you do this, there are a few things that you wanna keep in mind. It's not like entertaining in the summer. When it's cold outside, people want to be warm on the inside, and there's no better way to do that than with a warm beverage or even soup. I like to put soup in these types of containers where they can just pour it into a cup, and of course I have plenty of cocoa and coffee available to them. For instance, for tonight's party, I've created a rustic and warm environment with my fireplace and some decor that lends itself to the holidays. Now if you don't have an outdoor fireplace, a fire pit or a chiminea will work equally well. Now, no matter what you do, you can't control Mother Nature. The wind's gonna blow no matter what. So I like to use table covers because they have corner seams. You see, this snug fit will keep you from worrying about pinning or clipping them. They're also machine washable. After all, the food's gonna spill just like the wind's gonna blow. Now, for some of the table decorations, I've kept it really simple and again in that rustic theme. I took some firewood and cut them at various heights to serve as pedestals for my centerpiece and accents. These, along with the fun holly luminaries, brighten everyone's spirit and blend right into the natural surroundings. And of course, if you're going to have an evening party, lighting is critical. Again, I wanted to keep it as natural as possible, so we used candles, lanterns, the fire from the fireplace, as well as Christmas lights and the shrubbery. I also have a few finger foods, like crostani with tapenade, as well as chips and dip. I find it's easier for people to nibble on instead of having lots of plates and flatware. Now for fun, I've created a little garnish bar for those who love hot chocolate. And finally, I've got everyone's favorite, s'mores. I think if your guests know there's going to be a fire, they're probably going to expect s'mores, don't you think? I don't know, maybe I'm just telling myself because I love them so much. So when the temperatures drop, never fear. There are lots of ideas you can use to enjoy that colder weather and create a memorable time with your friends and family. Of course, after any party, there's always the cleanup, but I don't mind, I enjoy sharing my home with family and friends, and I'm sure you feel the same way. They seem to appreciate even the smallest gesture. Hoping today's show, you've come away with some ideas that will make your next gathering simple and easy. For Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith.
Twas the night before Christmas, and all over the farm, the animals were resting, curled up and warm. Now Santa's not known to ducks, dogs, and sheep, so all they wished for was a long restful sleep. The chickens were roosting, dreaming of corn, laced wine dots by Forpingtons and brown leghorns. In the field, Moose was dozing, more often than not, clearing his mind of his deep donkey thoughts. The ducks were all sleeping, the geese and swans too, all snug in their down, the days swimming through. And I in the farmhouse, in a bright cozy nook, had just settled in with hot tea and a book. When outside the house, a car horn was sounded. I went to the window, then stood there astounded. There on the driveway, though I asked, is it real? Was a cherry red vet with St. Nick at the wheel. My sleigh's in the shop, said Santa quite quick. Barred the wives, it's got a big kick. What brings you here, Santa? This is an odd twist. I was worried I'd ended up on your naughty list. Oh, oh, oh no, Ellen, you've been rather nice. I'm sure of that fact. I've checked my list twice. A bit bossy, perhaps, but I'll let that one go. You've done plenty this year to help others grow. It's the animals I'm here for, gifts for the whole lot. They've all been so good when others have not. With no further chat, he set right to work, pulling his bag from the car with a jerk. This bag was magic, that much was clear. He thrust in his hand and presents appeared. For Smudge a new Frisbee, for Squeak a red ball, for the turkey's reprieves from being stuffed in the fall. For Amos the rooster, new Argyle socks. Didn't see that one coming, but he'll like them a lot. Trudy the horse got a fat sack of grain. The ducks, tiny sweaters to stay warm when it rains. To every farm creature, from the big to the small, the right gift was given to bring joy to all. And when he was done, St. Nick turned to me. Here is your present for under the tree. From his bag he withdrew, a bright ribbon gift. I shook it a bit and felt something shift. No peeking, Alan. You'll just have to sweat. Don't open till Christmas, and it's not Christmas yet. With that, Santa turned and walked to his ride, dropping in his bag and settled inside. Good night to you, Alan. Santa said with a grin. Be a good boy till it's Christmas again. Then he fired up his sleigh and was soon lost from sight. Red hat in the breeze, more stops on this night. And I heard him exclaim as he vanished from view, Merry Christmas to the animals and also to you. Merry Christmas to you, friends. May the season bring you joy. Lots of sweet dishes and even a toy. Happy New Year as well. And may yours pass without harm. All our best wishes from Moss Mountain Farm. It's not lifeless. I want something new, something natural and fresh. Like nature would do. <laughs> what brings you here, Santa? Oh. Okay, try again. Go back to one. What brings you here, Santa? <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> that's good, that's good, that's good. I'm trying to do my best Bill Murray. You shoot your eye out, kid. <laughs>